नहीं रुकेंगे नहीं रुकेंगे सबको स्वस्थ करेंगे पूरा स्वस्थ करेंगे नहीं थमेंगे नहीं थमेंगे अब ठान लिया है मंजिल पाके रहेंगे सर स्लो मो एक यू के सी है मेरा दोस्त उन्होंने मैंने इंडिया टूर किया था वो मोरसन बजाते थे मैं बीट बॉक्स मैं मोरसन बजाता था वो बीट बॉक्सिंग फिर जैसन सिंह वो भी यू के से उन्होंने थोड़ा सीखा फिर मेरे स्टाइल से थोड़ा राजस्थान में किया कोशिश की बहुत सांस चाहिए होती है जी सर अभी मैं तो इसमें गाना पूरे में बजा लेता हूँ सर अच्छा इसी में सारी में सीख गए वो खुशी में थोड़ा सांस का टाइम ले लेता हूँ बीच में मैंने देखा वक्त गाने में भी कर रहे थे बहुत बढ़िया जी सर बहुत ही बढ़िया लाजवाब ये अलग ये आपने जो राजस्थान का जो सांस्कृतिक म्यूजिक है उसमें आपने ये मिलाने की कोशिश की है जो सर जो पहले गाने हमारे सिर्फ फॉर ट्रेडिशनल थे लोगों को लगता था कि भाई कार है कार ट्रेडिशनल अब जो वही गाने पुराने जो बरादर बरदर ने बनाए हैं अब उसको अच्छी तरह से बीट बॉक्सिंग के साथ लोगों को पैसे लगे लोग डांस करते हैं और लोगों को थोड़ा लाइक्स भी समझ में आ जाता है बीच में तो आप रैप भी कर रहे थे आप तो रैप भी कर रहे थे तो काफी हमारे संस्कृति को काफी आगे लेने के लिए बीट बॉक्सिंग भी सहयोग कर बहुत कूल लग रहा था बहुत बढ़िया लगा बहुत ही बढ़िया थैंक यू बहुत ही बढ़िया So good hygiene is the first step towards preventing and combating illnesses. Personal hygiene is not only about keeping yourself clean but also about preventing the spread of contagious diseases. While we all knew the importance of hygiene and washing our hands, the COVID-19 outbreak has overly emphasized the importance of hand washing with soap to reduce the spread of the virus. We have with us Dr. Sunil Agar, Chair, Program Advisory Committee, National Institute of Health and Family Welfare, also member of the Lancet Commission, Sonali Khan, Managing Director, Sesame Workshop India, Temjan Imna Along, Minister for Education, Nagaland, Ravi Bhatnagar, who's been with us, Rekit, and of course we have Siddharth Malhotra, who is staying on with us for this part of the show as well. And at 1:30, we will also be joined by Dr. Somya Swaminathan, who's the Chief Scientist, World Health Organization. So I think. If we really talk about hygiene, uh, the first thing what we let me come to you first, Adharth. When we talk about hygiene, do you think post COVID we become more conscious? Has the hygiene quotient really got, got? And we always said wash our hands, keep our surroundings clean. What are your thoughts on that? Oh, absolutely. I think during the pandemic, uh, we were just all the time. All the campaigns were there to wash your hands. Uh, from I think from the from the youngest child to the eldest in the family knew, um, you know, it's so imperative to do it. and i think now we've imbibed that culture within our society i think every kid knows the importance of cleaning their hands for various reasons and the benefits they got uh, from it even during the pandemic or now uh, i think which is a positive change uh, growing up in my younger days in delhi we were quite slightly ignorant about things we were not so uh, you know careful when we were picking up things or when we were playing sports or coming back home uh, so i think it's it's a great change and it's a must to keep the society healthy to keep uh, younger kids more aware of the infections they could get today and uh, yeah it's a lovely change and we should encourage you it you said that fitness 
helps prevent disease. Show us one yes, bit of fitness sitting in that chair that you can yeah, do. Yeah, sir, I was, I was, I want to suggest yeah, you one thing. On this chair, you're going to sit every day. Mr. Bachchan will do this immediately <laughs> after you. Let's no, see. this is a tip for you, sir. I think oh, you're, God. it's an easy, it's an easy tip for you, sir. You just stand up if the, if the chair is strong enough oh, wow. and you have to hold your feet and do reps. Oh, God. I, simple, so, yeah. this is very simple, sir. Tomorrow, tomorrow we'll do it. No. Aap this pure din... is for those people who sit on chairs the entire day. <laughs> Correct. Oh, sir, is, I asked you. sir, sir has worked out today and come. Yeah. So it's your workout is left, sir. <clears throat> yeah. Are you trying to, are you trying to tell me something? <laughs> no, I thought it's a... But you come know, on, what, what you were saying on, earlier on... Uh, it's not possible. <laughs> what you were saying earlier on, uh, that you know this whole incentive about washing your hands and all came about post-Covid or during Covid. मैं ये कह रहा हूँ कि सर ये आया कैसे? All right. कहीं न कहीं एक डर था हमारे मन में कि अगर नहीं करेंगे तो ये हो सकता है। हम ये नहीं कह रहे हैं कि आप बच्चों के अंदर डर पैदा करें, लेकिन अगर उनके अंदर एक चेतावनी पैदा कर दें आप, जो डर के साथ मिली हुई है, तो कहीं न कहीं उनके अंदर भी वो आदतें आ जाएंगी जो कोविड के समय आए they knew that you know if if you don't you know sanitize your hands you could get ill. Yeah. Yeah. They're seeing all kinds of terrible examples all over the world. Yeah. Basically, you know the consequence. Absolutely. Yeah. So if you can inculcate that yeah. at a very early age, not give them the fear of the illness. disease or the illness. Just be aware. But, yeah. So do you think that has been one positive outcome of this whole? Absolutely. Thing? Yes. As you're mentioning yeah, that we absolutely. never had that kind of awareness. Yeah. Now everybody is getting it, right? Yeah. Even though, I mean, uh, God willing, the COVID has almost kind of disappeared, but you're still in that habit. You have sanitizers yeah, all yeah, over the yeah, place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You keep awareness. washing your hands. Yeah. And you know, wash it at least 20 times. Those yeah. habits have now been sort of imbibed inside you. Yeah. yeah. Quite true. And like earlier, we always said, wash your hands. We don't need to do that. I was telling Siddharth, you know, you to tell the children, you know, wash your hands. Now I think it's just imbibed in them, yes. whether they come back. So that's a very good habit. It's which, that factor yeah. that, you know, this yeah. could lead to something bad. Yeah. Yeah. And therefore, let's do it. Yeah. yeah. And I think that needs to be brought in again at a very early age. At an early age. And earlier, the better. So let me just go across to Dr. Garg. Uh, Dr. Garg, we're talking about how important hygiene is. Of course, post-COVID, we all are more conscious. But when we talk about like how we talk health for all, tell us how important is hygiene for all, like from pediatric to geriatric. Uh, thank you so much. First of all, happy Durga Puja to all of you. And this is a very auspicious time. And I studied from Mahatma Gandhi Institute of Medical Sciences where you know hygiene was inculcated right from young medical graduates to over a period of time. And you know that it's this very, very important question which you raised that you know. Hygiene is very important, I'll say right from the preconceptional phase to, you know, the pediatric and to the geriatric component. I will also like to tell you one of the real case instances as I was, you know, with, I just finished my post graduation in 83 and my husband was a practicing pediatrician. We had a, a child who was born with low birth weight that was to the tune of 1.5 kg. And at that point of time, we never had advanced services and all. It was her mother was MA, but the child was, you know, so much pre, uh, low birth weight. Just by training the mother that she has to wash her hands regularly, she only will take care of the child. The nursing personnel will not be, you know, at that point of time, you can imagine the nursing care. I'm talking of 83. So this is where today, you know, I think two years back, my husband gets a call that drops up the child, which you, you know, kind of manage, he has become a district magistrate. So that is what I would like to say, the importance of hand hygiene, importance of mothers managing at every point of time, you know, we don't, we only not focus on the children. We have to focus on the mothers. We have to focus on the youth. We have to focus, you know, on the, you know, adults and at every point of time and the elderly, you know, they are so much dependent. It is, we are not talking of young old, old, old and very old people. So at all point of time, you know, the whole concept of hygiene, hand washing becomes very, very important from a public health perspective. In fact, this has got to become a part, this has, uh, COVID has, you know, kind of humbled all of us. It has propagated a lot of practices. And it has, you know, I will say that basically at, at this point of time, when we are able to reduce a lot of, you know, diarrheal diseases and also address malnutrition and also reduce, you know, under five mortalities because of this. And ultimately, we are able to, you know, healthy child is a backbone of any nation. So that 
habits which you imbibe in your childhood are going to go a long way in you know modifying your behavior in the subsequent years of your life so that is very very important that it is family who has to practice you know the practice of hygiene and it is not only i am talking of hand hygiene it is about the hygiene which is starting from head to toe and particularly which is not much addressed is the is issue of sexual and reproductive health hygiene and menstrual hygiene i will also tell you that i uh, as a president of uh, iapsm 21 22 and i was the first lady president which brought about uh, advisory on menstrual health and hygiene management where we not only talked about the menstrual health of the girls but we talked about the alternatives also like menstrual cups we also have to think about the in- impact of these pads on the environment so many of the girls from academic institutions like all india institute of medical sciences and all they are using menstrual cup and imagine a cost of menstrual cup is only 365 rupees and it is going to last for 10 years so we have to look from that perspective as well so overall we have to talk about the concept of hygiene in a very holistic manner so that we are able to make a dent on all the mortality and morbidity indicators as well okay i think thank you so much for explaining that so well we've been seeing how music you know performing arts make a difference and you know for messaging as well so, so uh, uh, miss khan i would like to ask you that sesame workshop has been working across um, you know 150 countries trying to tell children the importance of the basic things like hand washing in terms of communication we just saw how rais khan ji had performed and even if it's something on hygiene how well it came across to us how effective are these methods of puppetry music performing arts in giving a message and actually bringing about a change in the behavior especially for children uh i think this is a beautiful question uh just remember children can be engaged if you can really make them happy make them smile make them even sing along uh sesame from its inception really realized that you know if you can if television jingles can as something that children learn and it was it's very common if i ask you today which is that uh, jingle you remember from your childhood you'll come up with your favorite one right it's it's so embedded in your memory this music this song so from that actually the founders of sesame realized that this is how children were learning it was very basic and therefore this became the dna of sesame uh, as we were talking about hand wash just now i think the washi washi ad everybody was saying washi washi and that's what children were repeating to themselves so it's just how engaging you make it and how fun you make it children love both these aspects the muppets play a very critical role i mean i was just enjoying the performance as well just a little while ago i think everybody of us were riveted and listening and maybe even remembering the words uh, children learn like that so i think for us uh, this has been the prime way of engaging children with messages and you know we all just spoke about the fear of covid i think children were just like sponges absorbing whatever was going on in the ecosystem one of the biggest thing that sesame was trying to do is reduce that fear make children understand what it was to you know to look at covid prevention hand wash you know build those kinds of habits which can go a long way i just want to emphasize one point that i think the panel was just making about building habits early uh sesame works with children between the age of 3 and 8 and that's the foundational years if we can build these habits of hygiene and well being clean toilets wearing slippers to the toilet washing your hands after using the toilet washing your hands before eating after eating they will go a very long way uh they are the most important life lessons that we can teach children and rather than make them boring rather than make them you know like sort of someone just punishing you if you don't do them make them something that the child can really learn happily i think that's really critical uh, that we should be focusing on when working with younger children another thing is not just the children will learn habits themselves remember it's it's like an old co- uh, saying that children are our teachers they can also teach you children remind adults Ch- children can teach peers about habits and i think that is something that we can focus on just don't look at children as receivers of information receivers of messages they can actually be our biggest teachers reminders of what those healthy habits are all about uh i just like to ask uh, the education minister of nagaland mr elong 
You know, there's a misnomer that the North Indian states, Northeastern states, uh, or rather the states to the Northeast of our country, they are not giving too much attention to hygiene and the, the process of hygiene is almost absent there. As the education minister, what are the steps that you're taking that hygiene can be inculcated amongst the children? Sachin sir, namaste first of all, and to all the panel that is there. I think uh, the Northeastern states not giving much importance to hygiene, I think it is a little bit of a wrong information. But uh, concurring to that, I would like to put this way that even in states like Nagaland today, hygiene is taken in a very holistic manner. And as we are small people living in the villages, most of our people are living in the villages and on top of mountains and hills. The, you could have seen even during the COVID the less number of people were affected by COVID because of our people's strong community initiative to keep hygiene and to be clean and to promote those things. And sir, you would be glad to know that some of the cleanest villages in the whole country are in, in the Northeastern villages, yeah. Northeastern area. And as an education minister, I take care of higher education. We are very serious about uh, not inculcating fear, but inculcating the right knowledge of holistic uh, mm -hmm. hygiene and holistic health. So as students take it as a part and parcel of them learning and getting knowledge in every way, COVID-19 has brought a tremendous change, even in our state. And people, students are more aware about the disaster that it can bring by not being hygienic, by not being clean. And so even in the education department, the teachers are teaching the students how to, because COVID has still not been over. It is still not over. And to think that COVID will not come back would be another uh, disaster for us. So hygienic atmosphere is holistically being taught in the education sector nowadays. And like what our madams have been saying, hygiene is not only about washing hands and keeping clean, but also it's about the holistic hygiene, which each and every one of us would pursue to keep ourselves healthy, sir. Thank Could I just much. ask you a question? Actually, I think Amitabh just clapped when you said that you are, the Northeastern states are in fact an example for the rest of the country in terms of discipline, holistic uh, health and cleanliness. And you just don't do it out of, and it's important again what Amitabh was saying, not out of fear, you do it out of consideration for others as well. What are the things that we can, as the rest of the country, learn from you in the Northeast? There's so much to learn, but Give us a couple of things related to health that we can learn from you. Dr. Roy, sir, one of the best way of implicating and doing those things in a region like Northeast or even in our, the rest of the country is communitization of any health issues, anything. Sir, in our state, example in a village or in a community, we take it upon the community to keep such cleanliness or hygiene. We narrate a narrative, not just impose. Now example, through the COVID, one of the great things which the government of India and the health ministry had done was the caller tunes on the phones. Every time we pick up the phone or we have to make a call, the COVID issue was always in our mind. And that brought a lot of you know, awareness amongst the people. But tackling any issue, whether it may be in the villages or in the colonies or in the, you know, in Delhi and Mumbai, those are the flats, the uh, 
communities that live in the flats. Right. Can pick it up holistically. Because single persons in Divya is sometimes very difficult to do. But when we take it in community wise, example, we were very aware about people coming in, going out of the villages. That's how we could protect our villages. Nagaland has more than 2,000 villages. And if COVID were to enter, example, then the whole community would be affected. So the community takes the stand that, okay, all the, you know, drainage would be clean. Uh, there would be every week, a group of young people would clean the whole village, example. And women would go, those who have knowledge would go among the women, all those things. I want to let you know, ma'am, uh, the doctor, madam, who is there, there are places, ma'am, you are very right. There have been places in our Nagaland, as far as Noklak district, where one of the uh, superintendent of police, one madam, um, uh, IPS officer, Mrs. Betty, she did a wonderful job because in such places, the menstrual hygiene was a very, very big issue. I don't want to elaborate on the media how the problems were, but she took the initiative with the community, with the women, and then today they are able to be hygienic and they are able to, you know, get the benefit of menstrual hygiene without having so many problems and diseases that the women folk in the community were. Right. So the community initiative, Dr. Roy, is one thing which is very important. Right. And likewise, people in the hill area, unlike me, all are healthy. What my brother Siddharth was showing that exercise on the chair, I don't know when I can do that, but <laughs> I really would one day pursue to try to do that. You, you and I, we will do it together <laughs> day after Thank tomorrow. You. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Just did it. Temjain ji is also known as the viral minister. Yeah, yeah. speeches jo hain, wo itni viral ho jati hain. Or in Hindi ki speeches bhi, English ki speeches bhi. <laughs> and he knows how to have fun in politics. Ji. And oh, also communicate. Still get that's your his, message across. Yes, yeah. that's his strength. So he's a very, very effective communicator. But Ravi, you know, I wanted to ask you, what is Rekit's plan in the Northeast? Thank you so much, Sanket, for asking uh, this question. We have been supporting government of Nagaland for over three years by the virtue of our program, which is on the birds and the bees talk. <laughs> and uh, we are very keen to actually partner with the government of Nagaland on the Hornbill Festival this year mm -hmm. and the times to come. And especially, like, we want to be the hygiene partners to the Hornbill Festival. And, like, the Zero Festival just got over, now the Hornbill is coming. It will be a very great, uh, you know, opportunity for us also to learn more about the culture, the cultural sensitivities, and to come back and, you know, take this program to the other northeastern states. Mm -hmm. Under the able leadership of the Honorable Minister, in Nagaland, we really think like, you know, if the things are uh, great in Nagaland, maybe like Arunachal, we will take it there, or, you know, Meghalaya, we will take it there. But, uh, you know, uh, it's a very good state, and people are amazing in Nagaland mm -hmm. to start work with. So this is our one of the wishes, like, we do partner with the Hornbell this year. Thank you. Okay, Temjan ji, thank you very much uh, for joining us. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. मैं रईस साहब आपसे एक सवाल ये पूछना चाहता था कार्यक्रम के शुरुआत से ही स्वास्थ्य अगर आप जीवन में सब कुछ हासिल कर लें लेकिन अगर आप स्वास्थ्य हासिल ना कर पाएं तो फिर जीवन का कोई अर्थ नहीं है निरर्थ है वो मैं आपसे ये जानना चाहता हूँ कोई ऐसा व्यक्तिगत रूप से कोई वाकिया जिसमें आपको ये एहसास हुआ कि स्वास्थ्य पर ध्यान देना बहुत ज़रूरी है स्वास्थ्य में तो मैं तो जहाँ गाँव से रहा हूँ वहाँ से मैं साफ सफाई और सुंदरता के लिए ये तो सबसे बड़े इम्पोर्टेंट है ये नहीं होगी तो जिंदगी इसके ऊपर है मेरे तो इंग्लिश थोड़ी कम है ना तो पढ़ा लिखा हूँ सेवन तक पढ़ा था फिर भी अभी साफ सफाई के जो गाने हमने लिखे हैं उनके बारे में थोड़ा मैं बता सकता हूँ स्कूल कूल है एक गाना है जिसमें बच्चों को सीधा वही लग रहा है कि स्कूल कूल तो बच्चों को सीधा नाम से ही थोड़ा इंटरेस्ट हो गया फिर कूल है कूल है कूल है 
सांप इसे कूल जाओ कितरो कूल है तो ये एक ये गाना होगा एक सुंदर घर के ऊपर हो गया गाना सुंदर घर ना सांप राखो चोखो गाणो लागे सा घर ने रा करो में बखोड़ी मोरा रा तो ये सीधा में से एक इतना सुंदर आपने घर बना लिया इसका क्या तारीफ करे बहुत कम है तो एंड वासी वाला वो सुनाया तो फिर निरोग बनाओ राजस्थान के ऊपर तो ये गाने सीधे डायरेक्ट हमारे वहाँ राजस्थान में पूरे सीधा मैसेज ही आ रहा है Okay, uh, you know, like we've been discussing, habit awareness doesn't always have to be uh, dense or in the form of teaching. Uh, you can deploy tools like uh, Ray Sab was talking about. You know, uh, converting folk songs into a message, and now a puppet show is also doing the same to seamlessly speak about health and hygiene. <laughs> Okay. Lovely, lovely. Uh, at this moment, uh, we are happy to introduce Swamya Swaminathan. Also, thank you very much, ma'am, for joining us uh, and being a part of this initiative. Uh, you know, we have spoken on a number of occasions uh, uh, when when we were discussing COVID, the uncertainty around this uh, this pandemic, and now, you know, we are. we are approaching the end as they say i mean the who has also said that perhaps this could be you know the worst may be behind us what are the learnings according to you and uh, are we being very quick to unlearn those learnings thank you very much for having me on this show today uh, it's uh, it's an important day actually to remember some of the teachings of uh, mahatma gandhi who believed in living in harmony with the environment and basically you know in meeting the minimum needs of human beings with compassion towards all living things which are non human things as well as plants and i think the main lesson for me the pandemic has reminded us as well as a big other global threat to us apart from future pandemics is climate change and it's all boils down to what we've done to our environment and what human beings have done in the so called anthropocene era is basically focused just on human beings and we have um, destroyed both the land and the marine environment and i think for the future if we are to live healthy lives it's completely intertwined with the health of our environment so we need to focus much more as individuals and as governments on protecting uh biodiversity on protecting the various species and not allowing any more species to become extinct because each one has actually a a repercussion on our our own lives the second learning for me is that the vulnerable always suffer disproportionately in any shock we're seeing now what is happening also with the floods in pakistan and you know with the food scarcity in the horn of africa uh, partly related to the war but partly related to five years of famine um and this can happen to any one of us any country in fact all countries will be affected and so i think we need to really think about strengthening our health systems with a focus on equity which means that we look at those who have been traditionally left behind and try and bring the health services to them and the third uh, lesson is the public health a public health approach investments involving the community in any kind of a response in having good data systems in being able to act responsibly and in following science following data and really investing i think in science and research because those are the things that paid off for us countries which invested in public health and in science um research 
data systems and very importantly, community engagement and building trust with communities. I, I do just want to thank you so much for joining us today. Actually, more than that, for being such a brilliant uh, voice throughout the last two and a half years. Uh, you've joined us regularly and really uh, helped us a lot in trying to understand what this whole pandemic was about. I think when we started, we knew just about 10% of what this uh, COVID was, and we didn't know how to treat it. It was like shooting in the dark. First question is, how much have we learned since then? How much do we know now? Are we 80% clear about this uh, particular virus? Secondly, what have we learned about how to handle these in the future? Are we really ready? Or as uh, Sanket just said, we are de-learning and unlearning a lot of the stuff that we learned. And finally, what do, how do we treat the fact that vaccines are also created by profit-making companies. When the whole world needs it, everybody looks actually at their own narrow interest. And we didn't see enough spreading of various vaccines around the world. How do we handle that in the future? There'll be other, other pandemics, right? Yes. Thank you very much, Pranoy, and, and also for the efforts you and your colleagues make in educating uh, people with, with the facts and updating. And as you said, we've learned a lot over the last two and a half years, but I think the virus still has surprises in store for us. And one of the things we don't know is exactly how it's going to evolve. The hope is that the Omicron and its subvariants will be the predominant ones and that slowly the human race has acquired immunity, uh, enough immunity to protect against the severe consequences of this infection, even though we may continue to get repeatedly, just like we get cold every year, the colds are due to the same coronavirus family. Having a cold before doesn't stop you from getting another cold due to a coronavirus, but we don't get sick. And so hopefully this virus will also become something that uh, doesn't sicken the majority of us. Now, there's also the worst case scenario where this mutates so much that it's able to evade our immune responses completely and then again cause severe disease and death. That will mean developing new vaccines um, which, uh, which offer broad enough immunity uh, to protect us. And so that there's a huge enterprise right now ongoing to develop broadly protective vaccines against coronavirus, but also against the other major viral families that can cause future pandemics. So there are probably about 20, 22 viral families um, including the family of the, you know, the pox viruses. We, we know about monkey pox, but there are a number of other pox viruses. There are the influenza viruses. There are the coronaviruses. There are a number of hemorrhagic fever. We've seen this Ebola, new Ebola outbreak in Uganda, which is not responsive to the uh, already developed Ebola vaccines. So there are a number of hemorrhagic fevers. There's Nipah. So we need to prepare a prototype vaccine candidate uh, against these major viral families so that if and when there is an outbreak, we can quickly develop, uh, scale up the manufacturing of these vaccines and, uh, and use them uh, quickly. Uh, and the goal is really to shorten the timeline. This time we did it in less than a year, which itself was unprecedented. Next time the hope is to do it in much less time, maybe three months or six months. But that means preparation and investment. You asked about the global response. Vaccines have been a fantastic tool in the fight against COVID, but if only we had used them wisely in the first year when limited supplies were available, if we had given them to everyone who was at high risk, the elderly, the frontline and healthcare workers, we would have saved a lot more lives. As such, vaccines have saved, it's estimated that 20 million lives have been saved by vaccines, but a few million could have been saved if we had that global solidarity and a plan to share equitably. The private sector is certainly uh, very much part of the solution. Uh, I don't think vaccines can be manufactured at scale without the private sector. But what we need is a governance and stewardship from government and from international agencies. Hopefully in the future, we'll put in place mechanisms, contracts, clauses in the contracts, because all these companies get funding from government. And so their responsibility is then to supply enough doses 
for global equitable access. And that's really something I hope is a lesson that we've learned and that we can work uh, towards mitigating. And finally, you, you mentioned that we tend to forget the real risk now today is that um, we go through a cycle of panic and then neglect as things start settling down, we get back to business as usual. And then we're in for other shocks. So I think this is the time where both globally as well as nationally, we need to have plans in place, preparedness plans, response plans, uh, investment in, in all of the systems that we just talked about. And the last thing I would say is that the pre-existing health of the community played an important role in determining how many people died. And even though India had a relatively younger population compared to some of the high income countries, we have large numbers of people with hypertension and diabetes, non-communicable diseases, which in many cases, people don't even know they have it, it's undetected. And this contributed to a higher mortality. You found younger people actually dying of, uh, of COVID, which we need to make sure in the future that we deal with these silent killers, the silent non-communicable diseases. And I hope everyone will go out, get themselves screened for high blood pressure and, and diabetes, get on treatment. Of course, it's a lifelong treatment, but we can control it. But also lifestyle is important. So these are some things individuals can do. But of course, there's a lot that we need to do as society. Ma'am, this is Amitabh Bachchan. I just want to uh, ask, there's been a lot of controversy about the validity of the vaccine. And despite the fact that there are many that have taken the vaccine twice over with the booster, are still coming down with the disease. Whereas, there are some people of the nature of a celebrity that have refused to take it and are still surviving. Novak Djokovic, to give a, well, sort of an example. <laughs> the tennis player. And also, the other thing. Um, because there isn't such an, you know, an excess of the COVID right now, there is some kind of a discussion going on that this is just a common flu. It's not COVID. And until you do actually do a blood test, you're unable to find out the, uh, the exact nature of the disease. Uh, I say this with uh, some kind of personal involvement. I have been uh, in hospital for 23 days when the first outbreak happened. I've done two vaccinations. I've had the booster. And recently, I was down with COVID again, despite the fact that my antibodies were close to 500. How do we explain that? And how, does we, how do we actually explain that to the common man who feels that the injection or the vaccine is an intrusion into his body? He doesn't realize and he doesn't want to argue uh, with the medical fraternity and say, why should I take in something which is not going to help me at all? Thank you very much, Amitabh Ji. I think, you know, anything that comes from somebody like you uh, is believed by people. You're absolutely right. They don't believe us so much. As scientists, they think, you know, we change our minds all the time and we have to as the evidence changes. But um, this is a very important question. So as I was saying earlier, the vaccines that are developed um, are actually of very high efficacy and safety. All of them, all of the vaccines that the WHO has approved, we have about 11 of them. And what they do is prevent severe disease. With the virus has been trying all along to evolve. As you remember, we started with an alpha, then we had beta, gamma, delta, and then finally ended up with the Omicron now for the last eight, nine months. Each time the mutations have allowed the virus to try to either attach itself better to the cells, in the nose and respiratory tract, or to avoid the antibodies, like you were saying, you've got high antibodies. But because the virus changes its outer spike protein, it's able to just avoid that and still enter our body and cause infection. But as you gave your own example, because you had had the vaccine and the booster and then you got the infection, this virus was clever. It avoided your antibodies. It got into your system, but it didn't make you very sick. Um, now, there are, of course, uh, always uh, people who have not taken the vaccine and who haven't got sick. 
But I think that's just a matter of chance. If you're young and healthy, the chances are that you can still have infection and escape. If you're older or if you have underlying problems, like I was talking about hypertension, cardiac disease, neurological disease, you're at much higher risk of getting sick. Comparing it to influenza, yes, because that's another respiratory virus. Unfortunately, the influenza vaccines are actually much less effective than the COVID vaccines, only around 40, 50 percent effective. And yet vulnerable people, elderly, pregnant women and young children are advised to take it. Today, if you see the death rate due to COVID around the world, it's still hovering around 10,000 a day. That's certainly far 10,000 reported deaths. We don't know how many others are dying of COVID without really being uh, tested at all, probably many more. We know that 6.5 million officially reported COVID deaths so far in the last two and a half years. Uh, but you can multiply that several times to get the real mortality, excess mortality figures. So this virus, maybe because we're newly exposed to it, maybe over a period of a hundred years, it'll become like influenza or maybe even less than that. But right now, it is causing much more disease and fatalities as compared to influenza. And secondly, unlike the influenza vaccines, these vaccines are more effective. So just because we get the infection after getting the vaccine and the booster, we shouldn't think that the vaccines are ineffective. The reason that we're able to recover in a day or two, go about our life, not end up in the hospital, the ICU, is thanks to the protective immunity built because of vaccines. And some of us have also had natural infection that further boosts the immunity. As time goes by, we'll see how long this immunity lasts. It's possible that it could be very long lasting. It's possible that some people might need an annual booster, uh, especially the older uh, people who's in, in whose you know, natural immunity tends to wane uh, more quickly. But again, last thing is that, you know, there's a variability in person to person immune system. And we don't understand that when we do these large trials, we look at groups today, over 13 billion people worldwide have taken the vaccine. And as I just said, one estimate is 20 million lives have been saved, uh, you know, since the time that vaccines became available. So these are all analyses that have been based on um, looking at data from around the world. And if you look at deaths today in the US, still 400 to 450 deaths per day they are reporting. The majority of them are unvaccinated individuals. There's still a third of people in the US without vaccines and majority of people dying from the disease are unvaccinated. So I think all these facts are telling us that vaccines are helping our bodies to face this virus in a way in which we don't get sick, even if we get infection and um, we should be really grateful because all viruses, you know, we have not been able to develop a good a vaccine against HIV, uh, for example, or against some of the other viruses that, you know, are attacking us uh, every day. I just mentioned this Dr. new Ebola Swamila, type of... Uh, based on what so we're you, lucky. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. Just based on what you've just said, the data analysis, just tell us if you have a vaccine, what you will, you may still get COVID, but how, yes. what is the percentage chance of getting COVID versus not having the vaccine? Is it like you've uh, got a 20% chance if you've had the vaccine, but an 80% chance if you mm. hadn't? What is the data? And one, if you get it and you've had a vaccine, does it reduce the severity of the illness by how much? What percent? Also, uh, uh, I just want, sorry, yeah. I, I just want to add to what uh, Dr. Roy just said. Um, th these are very interesting questions, and these are some of the thoughts that are going through uh, within our community. Right. One, of course, that is the West more vulnerable to the kind of disease that is spreading through COVID, and we in the eastern part of the hemisphere, because and in India particularly, because we are so exposed to a lot of unhygienic conditions, mm. our bodies are becoming more resistant. That is one. The other is that if you had the COVID once before, and I'm again going back to my example, and then had the vaccine twice over with the booster, and then coming down with it again, mm -hmm. what my doctors did was, even after they did the first test and found out that I had COVID, after a couple of days, they insisted on doing another test to find out which strain it was, mm -hmm. because they felt that they needed to get rid of the strain right. 
right. in order to remove it completely from your body. And that test was done, and it was the Omicron. And another fresh treatment was started, which I, I'm sure you know because you're in the medical profession. You know, there are eight capsules a day, four in the morning, four at night, for about five or six days. And that kind of gives you the freedom to move around. How does one deal with all this? There are so many controversial ideas and thoughts. Do you have a follow-up on that? Yeah, yeah. bombarding with you, <laughs> you with more questions. Um, just from a health and fitness point of view, ma'am, I wanted to ask you if a lot of youngsters around me who are into fitness are very careful of what they eat. Uh, it actually stems from Sir's initial question uh, of athletes refusing to take, uh, you know, vaccines at times. Uh, anything that you put into your body, even when we take supplements uh, to you know, make up for certain uh, vitamins that we don't have. Does the vaccine, taking in multiple times, like firstly in my lifetime, I've never taken a vaccine uh, three times in, in a span of one year uh, or year plus. Does it take a toll on your, on your body on a hormonal level or what does it affect you on your, uh, what, what effect does it have on your internal organs from someone who um, is very fit and healthy, follows a correct diet, that's something even personally I was a bit averse to. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm just going to add another one to that. Anji. You know, a lot of athletes go through uh, uh, tests just before, like say, the, uh, they're an the athlete. Olympics. Like, yes. yeah, Olympics or any kind of games They're for substance abuse. Yes. Is the substance that is going inside our body vulnerable to that kind of testing or not? Because they may unconsciously have been vaccinated and have got some kind of a substance in their body which is disqualifying them yeah, which is bad, for participation yeah. in a particular event. A lot of questions. A lot of questions. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. No, no, no. It's good because there are lots of myths and misconceptions, unfortunately, around vaccines. And I think we, we have to do much more about answering these genuine queries and clearing doubts. Let me start with uh, health and fitness. Um, Health and fitness is really important for us. As I was saying earlier that the Indian population, unfortunately, has a very high burden of non-communicable diseases, which are starting at an earlier age. This is because of many factors, you know, uh, our diet, our lifestyle, our physical activity, et cetera. So what we should aim to do is to be as healthy and fit as possible by having, a, you know, balanced diet, enough exercise, avoiding tobacco, alcohol, et cetera. Now that boosts your natural immunity for sure. And so it, it helps you to fight, you know, the infections that we encounter on a day-to-day -day basis. What it does not do is give you specific antibodies against a virus or a bacteria, especially if it's a new thing that you've never encountered. Amitabh ji mentioned that in India, we are uh, exposed to a number of uh, pathogens when we're growing up. And Amitabh ji, it's because of vaccines today that we have been able to reduce infant mortality. It's not because that our bodies naturally became immune. If we have fewer children dying of measles, in fact, measles deaths are coming back, unfortunately, around the world. If we have no child suffering from polio in India, if we have reduced the amount of diarrhea and pneumonia, it is only because of vaccines. So natural immunity plays a role and we have to try to uh, strengthen it as much as possible. But for certain diseases, we need vaccines. And there is a very dangerous trend, you know, to think that natural immunity can protect us. And some parents in the U.S., for example, did not take their children for measles vaccination or polio vaccination, either based on religious beliefs or because they thought natural immunity is better. They are seeing, seeing outbreaks. And you must have heard about the case of the young man who's developed paralytic polio in New York. Uh, he did not, his parents did not give him a vaccination when he was young. So vaccinology, I think, has saved the maximum number of lives in the 20th and probably will continue in the 21st century. Of course, everything is always a balance between risk and benefit, right? Everything we do in life, if we go out on a motorcycle, today we step out on a, on a bicycle, there's always a risk that we could be knocked down but we look at the benefits and the risks. Uh, similarly for vaccines, the community, the scientific community has put a very high premium on safety because vaccine is something you're giving to a healthy individual, um, unlike a drug which you take when you're sick. 
And so a vaccine has to have a very high bar of safety before it is approved. And all regulators around the world and WHO insist on that. Now, of course, there are always rare side effects. I don't think there's any vaccine which we can say is 100%. Nothing in life is 100%, right? So you will have three to four cases in a million where you may have a clotting disorder which happens with one type of vaccine or the mRNA vaccine which are known to cause myocarditis in young men. It's three to four per million. But this, if you look at the benefits of that million doses of vaccine and you look at the risks, there's absolutely no doubt everybody agrees the benefits far outweigh the risks. And this is true for every, every new vaccine or drug that's developed. We must look at... Uh, uh, at just, benefit and risk. Just one last question, ma'am. Uh, how does India compare with the rest of the world as far as the mortality rate is concerned, uh, referring to COVID? And also, so as I mentioned, and also, and also, ma'am, the percentage of vaccination that India had as compared to the rest of the world, or let's say the Western world. Yes. So let's start with that. India has done an incredible job of vaccinating our population, just incredible to have vaccinated over a billion people, you know, in a matter of, uh, let's say, you know, 15 or 16 months uh, with high coverage of the primary course of immunization is, so is absolutely unbelievable. Compared unbelievable with the mortality and the whole world rate, accepts that. Because of yes, the high I'll percentage the of vaccination, because of the high percentage of vaccination to a billion people, how does it compare percentage-wise with the rest of the world? So vaccination is very high, but if you remember, it started in uh, 2021 with, uh, uh, with just the healthcare workers because supplies were limited, and then it went to the elderly, and gradually it was ramped up. So for unfortunately, during the Delta wave in India, most people were not yet vaccinated. Only the frontline workers and healthcare workers, few elderly had received it. And that is why we saw the impact of the Delta wave, because it was a largely naive uh, uh, population. Now, as far as mortality is concerned, we have mortality due to COVID, uh, where the diagnosis is made and it's reported. All countries are reporting that. And we have something like, I think, 450,000, 4 and a half lakh deaths somewhere in that range in India, um, compared to the 6.5 million uh, globally. But then you have what is called the excess mortality, which is the people who died during the course of the pandemic due to many reasons. Some of them may be undiagnosed COVID because you know testing was not really widely available, especially in rural areas. And some may have died because they had a heart attack and they couldn't get healthcare in time because the hospitals were full and dealing with COVID patients. So people did die of other diseases. Tuberculosis, case finding had gone down a lot, Amitabhji, you will know you're a champion for TB. And so it is expected that many people died because their multi-drug resistant TB could not be diagnosed in time. So that's called excess mortality and, and there it's, it's pretty high. So globally, we say six and a half million deaths due to COVID, approximately 18 million, so three times, actually people who died due to some reason. And similarly in India also, it's somewhere in that range that four and a half lakh you know, died of COVID but probably three to five times that many died of, uh, of other diseases. There are many estimates. And we, the only way to know that is really to strengthen our death reporting systems, our death registration systems, which are still weak you know, in most states. And that's something that I think government is going to focus on, on now. So you mentioned drugs also, Amitabhji, and it's, it's interesting that drugs were slower to develop than vaccines, but eventually we did get some drugs uh, towards the end of 21, beginning of 22. We have the Paxlovid, which is made by Pfizer, and then Molnupiravir, which is being made by many Indian generic companies. Those help to reduce the severity. So you said your doctors advised you to take it. Again, if you're in a vulnerable age group or you have some underlying illness, taking the drug when you get the infection may prevent you further from getting sick. So being vaccinated and boosted is very good. The third dose of the uh, vaccine, the booster dose is very important to have a longer lasting immunity. But for some people, taking the course of drugs when you get infected may also help you from uh, getting really sick. So we have another 20 questions for you. Um, <laughs> we, <laughs> thank you very much. That was really interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Swami Saminathan. Thank you so much for joining us.
And uh, we thank uh, Dr. Sunila Garg also, Sonali Khan also, uh, for participating in this discussion. Thank you very much to all of you. We'll take a short break at this moment. Be back with a lot more. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.